I'm not sure it's out of 10 drive. I mean, he's certainly feisty. A strange little one from such a handful it's so unpredictable they both had a point to prove I don't think that a driver would, would do that get out my freaking way he's really poor from accusations that they sacrificed him how we're not allowed to have favorites as journalists but i'd probably pick out how how does he do this so round five at silverstone and the 70th anniversary grand prix didn't disappoint if you like a good strategy race and we have a new winner of 2020 in Max Verstappen. Uh, the race, some people said, uh, I've heard people say it was a bit boring, Alex, which I was I was quite surprised at. But again, maybe because there wasn't so much on-track action, it wasn't as action-packed as maybe we've had uh, in the previous few rounds. Uh, but it was a good one for me. I don't know what you thought. Yeah, I also thought it was a good race. I mean, I'm a little bit guilty of when you're on the ground and you're on some, uh, a track and you've got that adrenaline, like for a journalist, getting that on the flag race support in is honestly the most, for me personally, the most stressful and also wonderful thing you can do. It's like chasing a new story. You've got like, you've got the bit between your teeth and you, you now your story is really, really exciting. So I was a little bit guilty of thinking that maybe some of the more boring races are actually, uh, you know, I, I think they're more interesting than they actually are. This one was a good one though. I mean, there's a, there's a philosophical argument. Do, is Formula, should Formula One have the fastest car hobbled by tyres very early on in the race and, and two excellent drivers in Valtteri Bottas and Lewis Hamilton having to tyre manage? But it, nevertheless, it produced a really interesting race. Max Verstappen was brilliant. And yeah, I, I personally thought that was a good one. Now, you mentioned Max Verstappen, Alex. We're going to get round to him eventually because obviously he had a pretty stellar race to to come out as the race winner. But let's 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 get rid of the people at the back of the grid first. No offence, but let's just cover the Williams off. So uh, George Russell, Nicholas Latifi, uh, again, um, tootling around at the back for a lot of the race. Uh, we've given them equal sevens. Um, why is that? Yeah, a pair of sevens to the Williams drivers because it was interesting. They were both strong and weak in different areas, which was which was quite nice. I thought, you know, it's only fair to give them the same score, really. George Russell delivers again in Q2. Mr. Saturday, as you call him, Jess, you know, four consecutive races now. He's absolutely pulled it out in qualifying. Uh, but it just didn't, doesn't quite come to him in the race in the same way. We know Williams still doesn't quite understand why its race pace isn't as good as qualifying. Um, but yeah, basically, both Williams drivers were undone by the fact the car just ate through its rear tyres. Uh, so had to make three stops. So it cost them a lot of time. Uh, but I thought Latifi... Uh, uh, earned a seven because he had a good start undid it all with a lock up at Luffield on lap one but actually he, en he ends up less than a second behind Russell at the end of the race which is a pretty good performance considering this is only his you know his fifth uh, his fifth race in Formula One uh, had the same three stop strategy uh, because of because of the high tyre wear and also he picks up a little bit of damage he says it was minimal in that clash with Kevin Magnussen but I thought that was a, a good drive from Latifi I, I was almost tempted to give Latifi a slightly higher score. It was. It comes down to the, the we wish that we could do like point fives, but it's not the order sport way, so we don't give uh, give fractions of points. But um, just because, as you said, we talk about George Russell and how good he is, and Latifi was still within a second of him with damage and with all those incidents that happened at the beginning. So I thought it was a really good race from Latifi, and usually he's one of those ones where I'm like, yeah, okay, you're doing all right, but. I was pretty impressed, but I think that's probably a fair rating. So, I mean, if I could give a 7.5 to Latifi, I would. I'm not sure it's an 8 out of 10 drive from him, but really good from the from the rookie. Uh, we mentioned the clash with Kevin Magnussen and Latifi. I mean, that was a right shove and a half, really, wasn't it? That was a definite get out my freaking way. And lo and behold, he was penalised for it. Um, very, a very Magnuson move. Is that fair to say? I mean, he's certainly feisty, I and mean, you got to love Kevin Magnuson being for being feisty. But the high speed at Stowe, that was really naughty. What he did, you know, he, he you know, he tried to hang on around the outside, which as we've seen with Alex Albon in Austria, you, you know, you you live by the sword, you die by the sword. But he just swipes across Latifi coming back onto the track, and that's that could have caused a really, really nasty accident. So yeah, he's rightly penalised, and that's why he's down at a five in this driver rankings. Uh, again, he, he made a very good start. Um, uh, Kevin Magnuson always seems always seems to do that. Um, and interesting. Um, he was actually said he was running some old floor parts after his crash last weekend in the British Grand Prix. Um, but, but nevertheless, you know, that, that might have been a bit of a gap. But he was also a well adrift of Romain Grosjean, who scores a seven in qualifying. I thought, I thought that was a pretty solid weekend's work for Grosjean. Um, got a, I, I thought he did just enough to earn a bonus mark uh, for the strength of his qualifying performance to reach Q2, best qualifying result of the season. Um, he did make a bad start, though. That's why his race got quite so hard and he couldn't end up doing the one stopper because he's lost uh, that just that bit too much time. Uh, and Magnussen retires. Uh, uh, one of the one of the drivers to uh, one of several drivers I should say to pick up uh, severe tire vibrations and actually has just decided to, to pull him in for safety reasons. 
Alfa Romeo, another driver who had a bit of an argy-bargy on track and whether or not he saw Albon, um, I have a feeling he did. But I don't know, maybe you've got a different uh, opinion on it. But Kimi Raikkonen gets a 7 out of 10. It's quite a lonely, sad place in that Alfa Romeo right now, isn't it? It is, and, and that, that's the trouble with these driver ratings, but when you when you have to consider the pace of the car and, and what the ultimate potential is, and Raikkonen can fail to get the ultimate potential because he qualifies last behind Giovinazzi, but he executes an excellent one-stopper, one of three drivers to do that in the race, as we'll come on to uh, later on. He used it to great effect to rise up the grid. As you say, he was pretty, was pretty on the limit there with Albon, but Albon in the Red Bull, faster car, got by, a great move. It was, it was fantastic driving for, from both, frankly. Um, he actually had to slow down ultimately at the end because, again, picked up a huge uh, huge vibration on his tyres. So perhaps could have been even better for Raikkonen. You never know. Uh, Giovinazzi, again, he's, he's a driver. Like Magnussen, they seem to have a knack of picking up uh, picking up cars on the opening lap. But he faded back from there. And it was, it was really interesting seeing all the back markers having to get past a certain uh, Sebastian Vettel, as we'll come on to later. Uh, but yeah, um, ultimately, Giovinazzi undone by the fact that Alpha opted to split its strategies. So Raikkonen got the one-stopper and made it work. Uh, Giovinazzi was called in and uh, yeah just 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 couldn't do it on the tyres. Yeah, interesting as you said because we didn't I think everybody we spoke to or that we when we were talking about what was going to happen in the race no one thought anyone would try a one-stopper so it was really interesting to see uh, the teams that made it work. Let's move up the grid then to Alpha Tauri and as you've said in in your notes and um, in your article that's over on autosport.com which you can also head to if you don't agree with our rankings and re-rank all of the drivers so head over there if you are already fuming uh, prepare to be more fuming as we go up the list um, not a race goes by where an Alpha Tauri driver doesn't shine, you've written, Alex. And I think I'm inclined to agree. And you've given both Kvyat and Gasly eight out of tens. Yeah, honestly, you know, um, we're not allowed to have favourites as journalists. But if you were going to be, you know, really subjective about this, I'd probably pick Alpha Tauri as my favourite team of the season so far because of the great job the drivers are doing. I mean, I wrote an article for autosport.com plus, uh, uh, you know, on Thursday when I arrived at Silverstone because I've just been so impressed by Pierre Gasly. I was going back and looking at the averages of, you know, these videos we've been making, Jess, and, and the ratings that go in the magazine. And he's equal second or so. Well, he was, he was ahead of this weekend, equal second with Lewis Hamilton. So we won't give away quite where they are uh, when it all shakes out now. But it was just really interesting to see. Equal second with, with Lewis Hamilton. That's amazing. Congratulations, Pierre. And yet, Alpha Tauri, every race, one of them seems to shine. This time in the race, it was Kvyat. But in qualifying, Gasly was mega. So I just thought that overall, considering what happened in the race, so Gasly actually undone by the fact that his team opted to cover Albon's very, very early stop. Now, that was an early stop from Albon. It was Red Bull played their strategy so fascinatingly in this race, and it, and it worked a treat for them for both cars. And um, it was really strange that Alpha Tauri opted to cover him so aggressively, and the team admits that after the race they're just like yeah we, we, we definitely didn't give um, Gasly the optimum strategy and it just it just really made life hard for him we've seen in previous races when one of the Austrian races that Gasly just can't can't live with it on the harder tyres quite as well as Kvyat and that's what really undid him but I think he deserves an eight because seventh place was fantastic and as we'll come on to later that actually affects uh, a couple of other drivers scores but yeah Kvyat I mean, it, it, he, he executed the two-stopper very well, started on the hards and went on to the mediums from there. Um, and the reason why he actually doesn't get a nine is because he was beaten so comprehensively by Gasly. He actually knocked out in Q1 when the Alpha Tower is really Q2 material. It was interesting as well to see, just flipping back to Gasly very quickly, and I'm sure we're going to cover it off when we talk about Albon, but it was very interesting that on-track battle between the two because you really I don't know if I'm just making things up because we know about the story that surrounds those two drivers, but it really felt like they both had a point to prove and both kind of came off all right in the end in terms of relatively where they are. But they both showed what they're made of, which was really, really good to see for me. So I think I'd be inclined to agree on those scores with you, Alex. We're going to move on to McLaren now. Again, like a bit of a strange one. Um, I think Norris said in the post-race interviews that he was actually surprised that they finished where they did because they did seem to really struggle for pace this weekend, um, which I think they said that they'd expected going into the weekend. Um, but again, like just a, just a strange, a strange little one from McLaren. Now you've given Norris a slightly higher score than Sainz. Again, I think one of those ones maybe where we wish we could give fractions of points rather than uh, just the, the rounded up or rounded down number. But why, why Norris higher than Sainz? 
So Norris gets higher because he made it into Q3, keeps up his perfect record, and, uh, and Sainz, unfortunately, becomes the first McLaren driver not to get into Q3 for the first time in 2020, knocked out in, knocked out in Q2. He did make a, a good, strong start to the race um, and, and actually you know, cycled through the, the pit, stop, pit stop strategy well to rise up to fourth at one point. Um, but a wheel gun issue costs him time, and that's really what, what screws uh, Sainz's race. Um, so, yeah, he loses a mark for the, for the qualifying difference. But, yeah, this was a really tough... Uh, tough race for McLaren they knew coming into the weekend that they they had a they have a sort of an inherent weakness on the softest tires which they spent a lot of time in practice trying to cure didn't run anything but the soft tire on the Friday which is really really interesting to see um but yeah Norris you know he didn't do a lot wrong you when you look at the cars that finished ahead of him and he goes up one position compared to where he started um I thought that was uh, I thought that was uh, you know a, a pretty good drive for Norris and and by the the definition of our of our ratings I think an eight was uh, was appropriate what do we think, uh, how are they going to be looking ahead for Spain? Are they going to have the same concerns or is it going to be a totally different track for them? The tyres are going to go back up a step harder, but we're going to be in inevitably hotter conditions. I must admit, I haven't actually looked at, looked at a precise weather forecast, but you think Spain in August, that's going to be really, really warm. Uh, yeah, but it's a very high energy circuit. They go testing there because of the downforce demands on the cars at Barcelona. So if you are, going to, if you are struggling with tyres, you would think on paper it might be another tough one for McLaren. Now, Renault's had an interesting weekend. Um, I think that's fair to say, both on and off track uh, in terms of everything that's going on about the racing point situation, which again, we'll, we'll get onto when we get onto that team, but also with a very strange uh, incident happening in Q1, which saw Esteban Ocon get a three-place grid penalty. Even considering that though, Ocon, you said, deserves an 8 out of 10. Again, it was a, it's definitely, he's getting better as we go through the season. He's having stronger and stronger performances, which is good to see. Now, is that because of car setup? Is it driver confidence? What, what do you put that down to? He has been a little bit inconsistent, Esteban Ocon, producing, you know, some really strong drives and then some, some not so strong drives immediately afterwards. But it, Renault really seemed to feel like it found something on Friday. Daniel Ricciardo was absolutely delighted after practice with the lap oh. times he produced and yeah. then saw what he did in qualifying. So, you know, that Renault is, is coming on nicely. They do seem to go well at Silverstone. I think Ricardo was looking forward to the event before, before he came in. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I think that explains why Ocon was, was that little bit stronger. But as you say, Jess, the, the blocking incident, yeah, he was alongside another car, but he knew immediately. You heard it on the radio. He told his engineer, we're going to get penalised for that. And he was. So, unfortunately, a perfect score is gone there. And actually, I, gave, I, 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 I docked him another mark because he qualified 11th, shuffled back to 14th by the penalty um, because of what Ricardo did in the other car. He was just fantastic in qualifying absolutely sensational to take fifth on the grid but as we'll come on to with Sebastian Vettel which is appropriate to talk about here because of what Ricardo described his spin as against Carlos Sainz Jr he called it a Seb spin which is I think hilarious and so damning to Sebastian Vettel um, and that's why he gets a lower mark despite the fact that you know his qualifying has been so strong unfortunately his uh, his, 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 his pace when he, when, he, when he pitted early on because he'd started higher up in, in the top 10 meant that you know it just didn't just didn't quite just didn't quite go his way and that left him battling other cars and then the spin happens also maybe uh, also also he actually was he actually ended up coming away from the weekend wishing he'd had Ocon's one-stop strategy which going back to Ocon and as we say how good he was this weekend one of three drivers to make that unfancied one-stopper work so hats off to Esteban Ocon I'd say so let's talk about Sebastian Vettel He's making, he's, he's making driver errors, which, like this spin, is one. And the fact that he's a four-time world champion and he has a reputation of spinning enough that Ricardo coins it a Seb spin, it's just not on, is it? But is it the car? Is it, like, what is, what is going on with Sebastian Vettel? I mean, this season, definitely the car is, is going to be a factor because it's, it's such a handful. It's so unpredictable. And as you say, Jess, when we talk about Charles Leclerc, there's, really, there's so many good and bad question marks over his drive. It's really, really interesting. Um, yeah, Vettel, I had to give him a four. He's had so many spins all by himself now all by himself and that's the problem that's why Ricardo coined the phrase a Seb spin because he spun by himself as he ran side by side with Sainz and Vettel just dropped it on the curb on the first lap at the first corner because you just don't think that a driver would do that and he's so fortunate not to just wipe out Sainz as his car snaps to the left he's really poor from Vettel yeah he was he was furious after that when Ferrari brought him in and you know accusations that they sacrificed him you know to to help Leclerc at, at one point well you know Ferrari said they didn't do that we have to take them at their word but he put in a drive that 
we saw Kimi Raikkonen end up doing that during his time at Ferrari when he was underperforming. He's, he's so bad, you know, he's just, he's just not good enough for him, Seb. And that's, that's, why, that's why, yeah, he can be angry about the strategy and he can be really furious with the car. And it's interesting, Ferrari say they will consider maybe changing his chassis. Maybe there is something broken that they just can't quite find. But if he hadn't spun, ultimately, that's, that, that strategy, that potential goes away. So yeah, I, I just yeah, he, he's sad. You're right, Jess. It is really, really sad because he's he is a brilliant driver. He's a fantastic driver. Just all going wrong, and it's just you know it'd be really really sad end to his Ferrari career. But on the other side, Charles Leclerc, wow. How? How? How does he do this? It's it's. I mean, you couldn't get two drivers with more different outcomes if you tried. But the difference with Leclerc is that he pushed back on his engineers and said, no, no, I'm going to make this one stop work, guys. Like, don't, I, I can feel it. It feels good. I feel confident. The car feels great. I always think that's the difference between a world championship driver material drive and a good driver drive. If, if you can use your own initiative and your own feeling and your own sense and you can convince the engineers and the strategists that actually what you're doing is, is going to work, then obviously it's always if it works and if it doesn't work, we might be having a different conversation. But I just think it, that for me is like the point of difference. And you'll be, you'll, you'll be interested to note, I'm sure a fair few people will be annoyed by this. He, can only, he only gets a nine because he was beaten by Gasly in qualifying. Now, Gasly was brilliant. Leclerc was brilliant in the race, but this is a weekend ranking. And that Alpha, that Alpha Tauri is just that bit too slow Leclerc shouldn't have been being beaten by that car even if you know there was a, you know you said they struggled more on the softer tires so I didn't like doing it but yeah I didn't feel we could have a 10. Right racing point I think everybody again was really hoping for a Nico Hülkenberg podium but as we've seen the racing point can be in contention but is usually pipped by the Red Bull um, so as we saw, Hülkenberg had an end of race uh, vibration that was quite a concern for the team. And so they pitted. I think we spoke on the Order Sport podcast last night, Alex, about the Tin Hat Brigade coming out and saying they just pitted him because they didn't want him to finish ahead of Stroll. But I mean, what a cracking comeback for Nico Hülkenberg. Oh, sensational. Absolutely sensational. And I've used my, my discretion, which I'm allowed to give him a nine rather than an eight, because it was really close whether he was going to get an eight or a nine. But that lap in qualifying, absolutely fantastic. As you say, Jess, I think the Red Bull is, is definitely a faster car. So, you know, he wouldn't have actually been expected to qualify third. Verstappen, as we'll come on to later on, maybe this arms his score. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a great qualifying lap. It was fantastic from Nico Hülkenberg. And he was very good in the race. He was very, very good in the race. And um, bad start. Again, that affected his score. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it was good on the time management. It just, again, it just, it, he picked up a really, really severe vibration. The team were just like, we, we have to pit you. And that's what drops him back behind Albon. But I think Albon might have got by him anyway. Uh, and Lance Stroll. And again, Lance Stroll, he's got a, he's got a five here because it was anonymous. He, he would have been, he would have ended up behind Hülkenberg in the race, having been really utterly defeated in qualifying that car. Yeah. You know, it does need something to go wrong for Mercedes and Red Bull to get on the podium. Definitely. They need, you know, the factor like, like we saw last weekend, that should have been a racing point capitalizing and, and not Leclerc at the British Grand Prix, but he just wasn't there, you know, a solid start, but he only got up one spot because Hülkenberg actually had a little wobble coming out of the loop and that cost Ricardo some momentum. And yeah, it just didn't look like getting back past him and, and really Lance in that car, which we know is so fast because everybody keeps trying to protest it. Everyone keeps getting <laughs> so annoyed about it. It just, it needs to be better. It really does. Right. Mercedes. And we've found, well, we knew about this heat issue. It's been something that's plagued them for uh, a while now, but we found their kryptonite this year and that was good. Uh, I think everybody enjoyed it unless you are a hardcore Mercedes fan, but how did the drivers rank out? Uh, we've got Valtteri Bottas ahead of Lewis Hamilton. Now, is that based predominantly on qualifying? It's based on qualifying. And actually, had they been allowed to have identical strategies, I don't see Hamilton beating Bottas in this race. Um, he admitted himself afterwards, I asked them, you know, how hard were you, how hard were you pushing at the, in the first stint? And, and both the drivers said we were time managing really early on from really really early laps but Hamilton said I just couldn't hang on to Valtteri and that's what the gap you can see he was under pressure from from Verstappen um and then again they come on to the hards and again Bottas is the quicker driver it's just the fact that 
Mercedes uh, Mercedes opt to bring him in at the same time as Verstappen, which I I still don't I don't understand that decision. Like yeah, Toto Wolff said we had no choice, there wasn't enough time. Well, maybe earlier on in the lap or at any point you could have said do the opposite to Verstappen because that looks like the only opportunity for them to win the race. Now they're much much cleverer than I am. And I'm sure they'll come out with a, with a detailed explanation of, of why they did that. But just on the face of it, it looked really strange. Um, so, yeah, I, I was really impressed by Bottas this weekend. It's, it's, it's a weird quirk of Formula One that we had a great race where the best car was defeated by the tyres because the car was so good. Mercedes going quickly in the high-speed corners at Silverstone destroyed the softer tyres. And that did, undi- that did for both drivers. Great pole position from Valtteri Bottas. Brilliant. Defeats Lewis Hamilton at his own game, essentially. Went on another day in the past. He would lose that. He would lose that fight. Um, so, yes, that's why Hamilton ends up uh, a point behind because he was the, the slower driver on, on both sets, on both compounds, and the fact that, um, that he was uh, um, defeated in qualifying, but still did very well to get back to second place. Brilliant drive. I think Bottas, though, can be annoyed with Mercedes for the strategy call. But this is where I'm going to say again, I know uh, maybe this is going to come back to bite me in uh, races to come, but this is what I mean about Valtteri said he, he complained after the race he was given the suboptimal strategy and he said that his engineer didn't tell him to push at the right time. Now I know they're in tyre management mode, I know they're hurting from what happened last weekend and that was the absolute worst thing that could have happened. But this is what this is kind of what I'm getting at in terms of like if Valtteri was, was happy or happy-ish, he said he was waiting for his engineer to tell him to push. Why didn't he just push? He's got the deltas, he can see what's going on, he's got the feel, which is why maybe I'd actually give them equal sevens because I think they've, they've, I don't know, it's just that bit for me where I'm like, Valtteri, come on, like, this is your year, this is the year you're meant to take it to Hamilton, do a 2016 and, and stop him in his tracks from this incredible run of, of wins and... It's just he can't he can't afford this, can he? He can't afford this this year. It's just and now he's third in the dri- in the driver standings. Let's let's move on before I get far too upset um, to Red Bull. And as we've said, Max Verstappen doesn't get a ten out of ten, and that is predominantly down to uh, being beaten in qualifying by Hulkenberg. It is, yeah. I mean, when you consider just just to go back to Hulkenberg briefly, the lack of running he's had in that car, no testing. Okay, yeah, he's in the, the car last weekend for practice and qualifying, but didn't get to race. So, you know, there's a huge chunk of experience that he's, that he's missed out on. Absolutely nails his lap, puts it third on the grid. And as we said, that Red Bull is a faster car. So, yeah, first happened there. I knew it coming into the race. He couldn't score a 10 no matter what he did, even though he was brilliant on Sunday. Absolutely oh. fantastic. I loved his radio messages. I loved his energy and his, and his you know, his attitude. It was just, it was just fantastic. And he, they, they, they forced Mercedes, you know, they, 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 by doing that strategy gamble, starting on the hards, they put Mercedes on the back foot and they just exploited any weakness and ultimately did over a much, much faster car. Now, the title battle thing, oh, it would, it would be so close. It would be something like five points if you hadn't retired in Austria. Oh. But <laughs> the problem remains that the, the Mercedes is much, much faster. And yeah. Verstappen is, 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 is fully acknowledging that. He knows that they've got work to do to make the car quicker. And that's really where it's going to get tough. He does seem to be the only one that could ever look like stopping Lewis Hamilton. So um, let's let's then end then with his teammate, who again, not not as bad as it has been. It was a much better performance from Alex. Um, and as as you know, Christian Horner said, um, you know, imagine if he'd have started in P four or P five because. He had a really strong push and was making all the right moves. And I loved watching him with Raikkonen, you know, getting his elbows out. Really, really brave moves, which is maybe, again, something that maybe Gasly didn't show last year, which is working in Albon's favour, is that he will get his elbows out and make the moves and bring the car home. So, yeah, just kind of like he just needs to get Saturday sorted. When you got your team boss saying, "Imagine if Alex had started P4 or P5 with the race he had in the, with the pace he had in the race," that just about sums it up. And he was great in the race. He put in some great moves. Like you said, I think he is really impressing Red Bull with the fight back that he's showing. But by the definition of our of our rules, the fact that Verstappen won the race, qualified well ahead, Albon was close again to not making it through. You know, he qualifies ninth. You know, it's lower ends of the top of the top ten. It was a solid performance, and that's why it's a six. He can't, he can't do much better than that. If we can, let's let's try and end on a, on a positive note for him. 
what a drive in the race. And, you know, it just shows that he's a, an excellent, you know, a racer. So we'll have to wait uh, not very long, only a few days until uh, racing or track action starts at the Spanish Grand Prix in Barcelona. Um, thanks everybody for watching. If you uh, agree or disagree with our rankings, let us know in the comments below. Also head over to autosport.com where Alex's rankings are up and you can change the rankings and give your average uh, feedback. So thanks, as I said, uh, join us next time and we'll see you later. Have you heard of Motorsport Rewards? Sign up today and start earning points to put towards awesome motorsport.